Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Jamie Bateman, alongside my partner in crime, Christopher Seveny. How are you today, Chris? I'm doing good, sir. How are you? <laughs> good, sir. <laughs> it's Friday. Um, I mentioned right before this call, the uh, the Ravens took a, a Bateman in the first round last night. So I'm thinking somehow that's good luck for for me and my family. I don't know. I'll take it. <laughs> uh... So my Patriots took a quarterback, uh, which uh, they definitely needed. But uh, you sound very chirpy today. You're like very upbeat, uh, you know, on the intro. So did you have a good? Let's um, start. Did you have a good week, Jamie? I did have a, a decent week. Some normal struggles in the note business, but overall, a pretty good week. Actually, but we've been doing a lot with our rentals. But we've got probably looking like five out of six in Maryland that are going to be turning over here in the next couple months. So, um, but yeah, it was a good, good week overall. Good. How about you? Not too bad. Did you want to share any more trials and tribulations along with that? Or? Um, so on the note side, I did get a, a notification from, uh, a township, um, about blight in a yard with one of my CFDs. So got some pictures sent to me, um, Is that the mattress house. Yes, you oh. may have seen a few of those pictures. So this, it's a yeah, let me just pop in. Yeah. This house had <laughs> probably like a dozen mattresses in like a half ripped open trailer. It looked like a dinosaur like chewed like claw chewed a piece <laughs> of the trailer in the yard and like mattresses just started shooting out of it. So yeah, it's on that. It's every one of these has a story, but this one I had to send to you because I'm just like, what is, what is going on here? I mean, yeah, there's, there's probably what, seven or eight mattresses that you can see that are kind of coming out of this. Yeah. Like you said, half eaten trailer RV thing that looks like it was burned up or something. I, I don't know what's going on, but, um, yeah. And I actually uh, sent it to my, it's a JV deal. I sent it to my JV partner and his wife happens to have a couple Airbnbs. So I said, you know, your wife, tell your, send this to your wife, tell her it's, she's not the only one with a cozy little Airbnb option. But, um, yeah, it's, I, I no clue what's going on there. We had done a, a, a mod recently, long story with this one, but I thought we were getting back on track, but at this point, um, you know, may just have to move, push the legal button again and move forward with the forfeiture. So I'm giving her two weeks to get, get this removed. Uh, I've got 30 days before it comes back on me and, um, giving her two weeks and then we'll, you know, start the legal process again. So that was one thing. Um, also have a deal that I'm selling that the buyer's title report has taken 16 days so far and he still doesn't have it. Um, so that's kind of surprising. So I was hoping to have had that one wrapped up, but been under contract for a, a month now. So we'll see where this goes. There's a couple, couple things I've been dealing with this week. Actually, you just made me think of my note and bolt for the episode. Oh, thank you. Uh, right, hopefully you'll, <laughs> hopefully you'll make me think of mine. <laughs> yeah. So my week, a lot of weird legal oddities I had come up this week, in many different aspects, which of course they all happen the week that my main attorney is on vacation, of course. Um, mm -hmm. so can't wait for him to, uh, get back and, uh, fill his email box um, with all these. I'm sure he knows questions. it's coming. <laughs> uh, he's probably wondering like, okay, why haven't I gotten many emails from Chris this week? Something's going on. Like, is he alive? It's the calm, um, calm yeah, before the calm storm. Before the storm. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I do though, um, is just, just a personal thing. Like when people are on vacation, I try as much as possible not to bother them anyway. Mm -hmm. Like at work, uh, my people who work for me, um, like I have somebody on vacation this week. I just, the, unless it's something like I completely don't know an answer to and I need to give somebody, you know, I'll shoot them an email. But other than that, I just let people enjoy their vacation because when I'm on vacation, that's what I like to do. Um, you know, when mm -hmm. I send an auto reply, it's like, Hey, I'm on vacation. I'm back next week. And the person keeps emailing me. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. It's personally, I just sometimes find a little disrespectful. Um, you know, let yeah. people enjoy their time, but that's just me. Uh, I digress already. Look at that. We're not even five minutes into the episode. I have a little timer now. I can see how long we've been recording. Um, so my week, yeah. So a lot of legal oddities. Um, we did reach a settlement on one 
property uh, with a borrower for a short payoff that he was supposed to wire the money by Wednesday. Of course, he didn't because the money was in one type of account, which you can't wire from. So he's been taking like $3,000 a day out. So uh, <laughs> so we're getting spoon fed that. Um, uh, had a few REOs. Uh, the one that burned down, uh, that we had uh, burned mm -hmm. down, we got that one under uh, agreement to sell. So that one actually is supposed to close today. I got another property in Arizona that we had taken back. Uh, that's a 20 acre parcel that basically is just a land uh, because the house and trailer on it are infested with uh, drug needles and animals. Uh, mm -hmm. But somebody wanted the land, which is good. So we got that one under agreement. I got an owner finance deal that was an REO uh, under agreement. We took back a property in St. Louis, which it's funny. This house has like a beautiful front door and it looks nice from the outside. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like, um, you know, going into a Halloween store, you open the door and it's like, oh my God, you know, this house is <laughs> a mess. Um, but have some people looking at it because the, uh, you know, ARV is anywhere from, I don't know, I've been told 100 to 125 maybe. Uh, it's a four bedroom house. Uh, probably I'd say needs, I don't know, 50 to 75 grand, but also would make a really good rental because I think the rental rates in the area, you know, 800 to 1,000 uh, plus maybe. Um, I forget. Somebody told me numbers. I got them written down, but you see so many numbers. So, yeah, so it's <laughs> been a busy week. Uh, we did sell uh, uh, about 10 assets. Going to have another tape coming out for people. Oh, another note and bolt. Um, oh, I man. Just you just reminded of... yourself of a note and bolt. Yeah, I just okay. reminded myself. <laughs> so, mine is going to If anyone about... hears any uh, background noise, we're having some minor construction going on outside so anyway it's actually a debt collector banging on the door looking yeah at Jamie. exactly <laughs> uh, so you know that's you know part of the stuff i had uh and i fired my va so oh boom you buried the lead there sir yes um, uh yes just wasn't uh, working out well when you don't show up for work in three days and don't reply to emails it's kind of like what do you expect so maybe she thought you were on vacation and she was treating you like you like to treat people on vacation. Oh, okay. maybe. So, <laughs> but, uh, so why don't we roll into today's main topic, which is we are going to be answering your questions. Uh, we are going to be going through some of the uh, Facebook group and um, answering some of the questions that have come through that may have some have answers already, but I want to talk about them a little more in depth because when you reply online versus actually physically discussing it, um, it's much different. So, yeah. And for those who are not aware and just listening to this podcast for the first time, it's the notes and bolts from the good deeds note investing group. Is that right? I think yes. I screwed it up and it's on, <laughs> on Facebook, on Facebook, so our Facebook group. Yes. Got a lot of people. It's not large, but it's got a lot of people. So quality. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, Jamie. Um, so here's the one that I wanted to kick off, uh, cause this one, um, uh, from your good friend, Stephen Berkey was mm -hmm. as you scale your note business, how do you determine the amount of cash reserves to have? Yeah, no, I think this is a, well, I answered it and I said, great question. And I do think it's a really good question. So we don't really talk about this that much. It seems like, um, like everything in this space my initial take is it depends <laughs> um because it really does depend on what kind of notes are you are you you know all, all about performers non-performers is this a, an ira are you running this like a business lots of variables but um i don't know if you have the my answer in front of you but i think i said something like a general rule of thumb might be you know one thousand dollars per performer and three thousand dollars per npl um and I did say, as you scale, I think you don't quite need that much because it's very unlikely that everything's going to go to crap with your note business all in the same week. So it's unlikely you're going to need all of a sudden a hundred grand for legal fees in one week. But, um, that's a good rule of thumb that I've kind of, uh, taken, you know, lived, uh, I guess, uh, used, I guess. And then the other thing I threw in there was I like to hold back a few notes that I could sell partials on pretty quickly. <clears throat> Um, just in case I run into a, a pinch and then all of a sudden I can get a cash infusion. So 
that's my initial reaction. How about you? So first, I'm going to go back to yours, and I'm going to uh, uh, pick uh, your brain on a few things. Okay. So let's take a non-performer. When you say three thousand dollars, is that your complete holding costs, or is that on top of other costs you're already holding? You know what I'm saying? So, so let's say you buy a loan for twenty thousand, and you got to go foreclose on the property. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, are you saying you only keep three thousand, including for foreclosure, or is it on top of what you think all the other fees are going to be? So when I wrote that, I initially meant. $3,000 cash sitting there. So much of this is state dependent and, and where are you buying this? And it's the, you know, foreclosure process is almost over. Um, but my, my initial reaction with that answer was $3,000 total. Um, no, I don't think that's enough. If you're going to have to go through the legal process in New York, for example. Um, so, but if it's a forfeiture, you know, and, um, you know, in a, in a, a judi non judicial state, you may, may be plenty of money. So again, you may be, you may have 500 bucks that you didn't need on another deal, um, that, uh, you could cover the difference there. But my initial thought was $3,000 total. Um, I just don't want to set, you know, it, it's that whole velocity of money, um, time value of money thing. I don't want to have too much money sitting in my my LLC checking account just sitting there doing nothing. So um, that was total. But what are your thoughts on that? Is that a little little skimpy, you think? Yeah, I think it's skimpy. Uh, so there's a few things. One is assume, let's assume you're using your own money first uh, versus, you know, using an OPM, other people's money. Um, I would, and this, it's a really tough question because it depends on, you know, how many notes you have, the status of them. Uh, but I would typically want to carry what an anticipated foreclosure cost would be plus an additional 2,500 bucks. Um, so if I'm in, let's just say, you know, Florida, you know, you're probably going to spend around seven grand to foreclose. I'd want an extra 10,000. Uh, if mm -hmm. I was in Ohio, you're going to spend another five to six. I'd probably still be around 10,000. Um, mm -hmm. from that perspective, uh, and, yeah. you know, and it really depends, um, you know, also how many notes do you have, you know, because right. as you have more notes, you can kind of pool some of that money to have a certain amount stockpiled. Um, yeah. You know, the other thing is too, you know, I, um, I've returned with some of my joint ventures. I've taken really too much up front, meaning, you know, a little too conservative and then, um, for example, we did a, a mod on this one that we're selling. Really didn't need much out of pocket. So it depends what your exit strategy is too. So, yep. um, you know, I probably took a little bit too much to set that aside on, in that, on that deal. So lowers the JV partners ROI a little bit, but um, I didn't need $5,000 for that one. Probably needed 1,000 for that. And that was a non-performing loan. So it depends. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> well, one thing I'll mention is if you're taking OPM, you know, what you don't want to do is short yourself either. And that's that kind of that fine line that you got to balance. But one of the things mm -hmm. I'll mention too, I mean, I think this is uh, important to clarify, you know, you can have less if you have personal funds that you can just take and put back into the business as well. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming this question is I'm just getting started. I only have $20,000 to start and I right. have no other money. How much should I buy a note for and how much should I hold in reserves? And yeah. the question really comes down to, well, it matters because if it's performing, you know, you probably don't need as much. I mean, you could pay a little bit more if it's non-performing. Okay. Is it occupied? Has a bar been making payments recently? Uh, where is the payment status? Uh, you know, because that, if, you know, you're thinking you're going to work a mod or if they want a mod, then yeah, you could maybe hold a little less. Um, but if it's somebody who hasn't paid in four years, you can't get in contact with, and you're thinking you're going to have to foreclose, then you're going to have mm -hmm. to hold more because the last thing you want to do is get caught in a situation where you run out of money and then you're forced to sell the asset. The other thing I'll mention real quickly, and I know you did your, uh, presentation on this topic was, 
you know, cost mm -hmm. that, that, uh, come up. Was it, what was that? The cash flow expo? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so, but there are lots of unforeseen costs, not only with the note itself or the asset itself. So, you know, if you end up yet, even if you're in the beginning stages of, of running your note business, you're going to have other costs, software, uh, you know, if you're doing any kind of marketing and marketing budget, or, um, if you have any kind of virtual assistant help, all kinds of licensing costs. So, you know, when I say one or $3,000, that's really meant for the asset itself. You should also have some additional funds in your, in your business account to run your business. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, but I think that gives a general, general ballpark answer for people. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And some of the people, um, actually you were the only one that actually replied to that comment. Um, I guess it's, you know, it was the perfect answer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was. Uh, so here's one that, uh, I just want to touch base upon because this gets asked a lot and uh and it's been answered and i think everyone's per you know i think you and i are pretty on the same page on this one but it comes up a lot is can you 1031 mm. 1031 exchange a contract for deed you know mm -hmm. into another property yeah i mean well i say yeah no <laughs> <laughs> uh first of all it's a question for you know your CPA, but, um, what's your CPA I think, told you, I guess is my question. I haven't asked that. But I think, um, Bob Malucky weighed in if I remember mm -hmm. correctly and, and, yep. um, he made it pretty clear that the IRS does not view a CFD or a note as a real property. And so you, when you do a 1031 exchange, which may be going away, uh, but About you have 000. to, so it only affects people like you. Gotcha. Um, you have to, so for those who are unaware what a 1031 exchange is, basically you can exchange a, a, an asset for another asset, but they have to be like assets. I forget what like the kind. actual phrasing, like kind assets. So if you've bought a rental property in the 1970s and now it's appreciated $2 million, you can exchange that for another property rather than selling that initial property and getting hit with lots of capital gains taxes and depreciation recapture. Uh, it's a, it's a way to kind of get around a, a big tax hit. And, um, so can you do that from real estate to notes? Uh, no, yeah. I've, and also I've never need, heard of someone doing it. No, you can't do it with notes, but the other component people think is well contract for deed I'm on title. So I own mm -hmm. the property. But the intent right. of the contract for deed is, and I did ask my CPA this, uh, but again, it's my CPA, not yours. So ask yours, you know, you're not responsible for taxes. You're not responsible for maintenance. The underlying purpose is it's a loan, just like a note. Mm -hmm. And the land contract or agreement for deed is what securitizes that note, similar to a mortgage or deed of trust. So all mm -hmm. it really is, is it's replacing the mortgage or deed of trust with a, you know, agreement for deed or land contract. So the intent mm -hmm. is it's a loan and notes yeah. are not, like we said, considered personal property. So they are not allowed to be exchanged. Now, somebody mentioned something about, um, Delaware statutory trusts, and that's way up here for me. Um, I've looked <laughs> into them in the past, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I've got one or two other things going on in my life that I haven't had time yet to figure out those to try and in my grand master plan of taking over the world, uh, in real estate, uh, figure out how to implement those into my business yet. So. Yeah. CFDs are, are, can be confusing because in some ways they're mm -hmm. seller financing and considered loans. And then in some mm -hmm. ways they're not like the, the blight in the backyard. I don't yeah. think the township cares whether yeah. <laughs> all they know is I'm on title. Well, the interesting so. thing is when they do see people on title that are from out of town, I think they target you personally. Yeah, probably. <sighs> so Jamie, have you ever bought a note that was already in foreclosure? I have not. Hmm. Um, I was helping somebody who just bought five, uh, in, in, uh, in Baltimore actually. Are you mentoring? But, them? um, not officially. It's just helping him out a little bit. Um, so we've 
been kind of working together a little bit over the last year or so, mm -hmm. but, um, and because I'm in the Baltimore area, I've got some connections as far as property managers and, and, uh, realtors and things like that. But so, uh, but I think, um, the one thing I did tell him was, and I think he was already going to do this anyway, but just keep, keep the, your, uh, attorney in place. I mean, uh, I think that came up in this, this question or some of the comments yep. under this question, but mm -hmm. I have not bought one that's already been in foreclosure. Um, at this point, I'm not sure why not, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm sure I know you have Chris, any insight yeah. on this? So I've bought se several, uh, you know, one that rings a bell was one in Michigan and I kept the same attorney and they were awful. And I ended mm. up, you know, they were supposed to file the paperwork. They never filed anything. They were saying all the messages they weren't getting, but I had read receipts on them and they basically mm. it said they filed the paperwork and I kept asking from where is it, where is it? And then they never gave it to me and then find out they never filed the complaint. So I just was not happy with mm. them. So uh, I basically replaced them with the attorney I used a lot. So in some instances, you know, while people say it's easier to keep that attorney, make sure mm -hmm. you know who that attorney is. I've got one right now in uh, West Virginia that I've kept the same attorney. And we had to get, uh, they had to go back after the title insurance company because there was an error on one of the documents. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you've been in title business for They've gone mm -hmm. back to the title insurance company back in January, and they still don't have an answer from them. That to me just seems hmm. really odd. So absolutely, yeah. You know, so I'm kind of yeah. Like, with this, who is this company type thing? With the uh, this small portfolio in Baltimore, three I think three out of the five loans were mm -hmm. they would essentially completed the foreclosure process. It was just yeah. a matter of the courts, mm -hmm. you know, with COVID and mm -hmm. everything, um, kind of catching mm -hmm. up. So or the, the, uh, eviction moratoria being lifted, that kind of thing. So the, the illegal work was essentially done at that point. I'm not switching attorneys. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. you did the competence or the, uh, yeah, the, the, the attorney you're using matters significantly. Yeah. So, yeah. So while it's probably recommended to keep the attorney, just make sure you're comfortable with them because it also isn't a big deal to switch attorneys either. Mm -hmm. so. Just wanted to kind of mention that um, for people as well, because that is um, something that, uh, you know, can easily be done just like there's, you are switching as the lender. So. Ah, yeah. Okay. So let's see. What are the questions do we have? I had them and I lost them. Have you ever bought loans past their statute, uh, the maturity date? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, from you, <laughs> um, work out for you. Well, it's still, still going. Um, at least one that I can think of right now that's in New York. And so we'll see where it goes, but, um, we've offered a couple of, uh, short payoff demands. Mm -hmm. And, um, actually the borrower just said, told, uh, our servicer that all communication needs to go through her attorney. But the problem is. She never provided the attorney's contact information. And so it's kind of hard to do that when you don't have mm -hmm. an attorney to talk to. Um, but I, you know, I think we still have some wiggle room on this one. The mm -hmm. price point was pretty low. So, you know, it's okay if it ends up being kind of a, a loss, but, um, I guess you've got your maturity date and then each state has a statute of limitations after that maturity date. Um, well, most states do. And so, um, yes, I have bought loans like that, but I haven't actually ex exited them yet. How about yourself? Yes, uh, I have. You have to be really, really careful because there's so many nuances with once you get past the statute of limitations. Um, you know, some states, whether the loan was signed under seal or not under seal, uh, when was the last payment can come into play. You know, you might not be able to collect on the note, but you can on the mortgage um, or deed of trust. There's a lot that you really, really need to make sure you have an attorney thoroughly review it ahead of time. Uh, because I've I bought some that, you know, uh, we looked at later on and thankfully during due diligence, I'm like, oh, these are good. And then when we looked at them again with the title and so forth, you know, an attorney came back and did a secondary review of, you know, after 
conversations with him, um, you know, came back and said, oh, no, this one isn't recoverable. Uh, you know, so it's been got to be really careful. Uh, the ones that I see a lot of times now that last payment, like 2009, and they mature into like 12 and 14 and stuff. I don't even look at those because the odds of those being recoverable or even if they are a chance the property or anything is going to be in good condition and so forth, you're kind of most likely playing with fire um, on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can get them super cheap, but, uh, you know, are you actually you know, going to make anything? It's almost like buying a second that's, um, you know, heavily underwater. You know, if you're going to buy yeah. them, you better buy a lot of them uh, and make sure you can try and hit on one of them. That's true. That's a good point. Don't don't just buy one of those. And mm -hmm. I, I would not recommend that for brand new note investors for sure. No, neither would I. So definitely not something I would recommend. Uh, um, let's see. What other questions? One here. So here's an interesting one because this one comes up a lot is, um, and again, this is ask your CPA. But for people who invest in with their self-directed IRA in a note fund, uh, you know, some depending on who your CPA is and how the fund is operated, uh, you know, it shows up on an ordinary income line. So would you be, you know, do you consider it um, UBIT, um, you know, and have to pay the taxes on that because is it ordinary income, which, you know, ordinary certain ordinary income is subject to uh, UBIT, meaning that if Jamie and I put up a lemonade stand on the side of the road and generated re revenue and we uh, used uh, seed money from somebody in an SDR SDRA to fund the buying of the lemonade, that person would be subject to um, UBIT because we are generating revenue actively uh, from that purpose. Uh, similar to um, now, I think if you raise capital, it might be UDFI or one of those, but, you know, similar to if you mm -hmm. borrow money on in a fund um, and we've got our fund and we actually excluded that language um, altogether to give people peace of mind that we weren't going to include it. But I see this mm -hmm. come up a lot. And Jamie, have you, you've invested in funds uh, in the past, correct? With yeah, IRA? that's never, I ha um, actually, well, yes, I have with my IRA. Uh, has not come up yet at all. Have you made money in that fund? <laughs> <laughs> so I've invested in some funds outside of my IRA that have done well. Um, the one in my, from my current current that I'm currently in is, uh, is not making money currently, but there's just, it's a rather small amount compared to in the grand scheme of things. So, but no, that this question has not, not come up. Nope. <laughs> It's interesting because um, it comes up when, and it's really dependent on kind of who your CPA is. And that's why I want to bring this up and why you really want to have a CPA that understands self-directed IRAs, notes, um, you know, a lot of real estate and syndication. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we, you know, in the funds I've run and the one we have together, you know, we basically state um, that the, the intent of the fund is to buy notes, um, you know, see if they get reperforming hold them to eventually sell them, you know, as part of liquidation uh, mm -hmm. is when we, you know, sunset that period. We're not in the business b to buy them just to flip them, you know, buy them mm -hmm. for a cheap price and sell them a week later. Now you can do that with a few, but if that was your primary business, you know, that would potentially be subject to, you know, an IRA investor having to pay the taxes on that. But because you're holding these for a period of time, trying to get them worked out, it's more mm -hmm. considered long-term. Um, from that mm -hmm. sense, it's not considered it. And I had that written up and I've actually gotten opinions from um, IRA advisors and stuff uh, mm -hmm. where I tell people, here's what we're doing. Get your person to write something and put it on paper to give to your CPA. So you have something mm -hmm. in the file that shows that, hey, I don't have to do, you know, we don't believe this so it really is comes, required. So it really comes down to whether this is a transactional business or an investment yep. based business. Right. And, and how the sponsors, you know, what are they doing? Like I said, if something this important question to ask uh, mm -hmm. as well is, you know, if you're investing in a fund, hey, is your intent to buy them just to flip them? Because mm -hmm. if you're doing that, then that could trigger, um, you know, some tax consequences for the borrowers. And typically most of mm -hmm. these people are credit investors who are paying, you know, 35 plus percent plus state taxes and stuff. Um, 
which is actually funny mm-hmm. because Trey Lance got drafted number three last night by the San Francisco 49ers, and they were mm-hmm. joking that even though he was drafted number three and his compensation is going to be about $6 million higher overall than number p- picks four, five, and like six, mm-hmm. his take-home pay is going to be a lot less because I think they said in California mm-hmm. between state and federal, he's going to pay like it, it, their home games like 50-something percent in taxes Whereas Miami wow. had pick number five, which has no state <laughs> income tax. So that person is going to be in the 35% bracket. Interesting. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Would you rather have bragging rights of going third overall or would you rather keep more of your money? <laughs> so, well, I, you know, you'd have to say too, what's the better situation, Miami or San Francisco? Sure. Yeah. Long term. Long term. Right. So I could argue. That's, we can, we can do a football podcast after this one. Yeah. Why don't we, <laughs> you know, we can talk notes in football. So. <laughs> Uh, um, so I think Jamie, um, you know, I think we've answered some questions and, uh, you know, we've been on for a little while now. I think we could wrap up this episode try and keep it a little shorter for our listeners. Sounds good. Yeah. I do think our Facebook group has a lot of really good interaction. People really, uh, find a lot of value in it. So if you're not in it, you should join it. Absolutely. And leave us a review on iTunes as well. Uh, did you think of my note and bolt yet? Uh, to yours. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> No. Go ahead. Okay. So You've got two, one or two. I got two notes and bolts. So my first one is you take back an REO property uh, and you get a BPO, make sure to do your own research as well. A perfect example is this land in Arizona. They wanted to list it for like $32,000. And I was like, hell no. I'm like, it's 20 acres and you know, is not a lot in that area, but it's still 20 acres. I'm like, list it for 50 grand. You know, forty nine 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 nine. Mm-hmm. First offer comes in at like thirty five. I counter, reject it. Get you know, three days later, full price cash offer. Boom. So um, I say that because again, the market's hot right now. Understand what it is you have, uh, and you know also what else is available. There also wasn't a lot of properties available in this area at this time either. And a lot of people mm-hmm. right now are looking for acreage and so forth. So to pick up land at twenty five hundred bucks an acre. I don't, you know, that's pretty damn cheap, honestly. Um, you know, and this mm-hmm. is in Arizona. You know, similar instances, I have a condo right now that we've been using as a rental and we've decided that we're going to sell it. And, you know, basically the listing agent, you know, called me up and stuff and he actually lives in the complex where this unit is. And he's like, there's not one unit for sale in the complex. And in this town, um, which is a small area out in Virginia, but it's out, you know, 150, 100 miles west of us. Um, you know, there's this little ski resort and golf course and stuff. So it's a nice little small area. He's like, there's only mm-hmm. three properties for sale in this whole area. And there's about, mm-hmm. he's like, I could name two dozen buyers right now. So it's like perfect mm-hmm. timing, uh, from that perspective. Yeah. So my note and bolt on number one is understand, you know, do your own analysis, uh, on mm-hmm. this same thing on BPOs. Cause I get people send me BPOs and they're low and I disagree with them, but you know, you want to do your own analysis. So that's one. Right. Note bolt number two, my special. This can be Jamie's replacement. Okay. If you get an ad, and I'm stealing this one from you, Jamie, actually, or you can relate to this one a little bit. If you bid on an asset, okay? Yeah. You know, you submit Mm -hmm. a bid and the seller comes back to you and says, yes, I'm going to accept that bid. And you go dark on them. Just be aware that you are probably never going to buy an asset from that person again. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's one thing to say, Hey, I screwed up my bid or something happened, which in this case, actually they didn't because I had three bids within like 500 bucks of this person. It's one thing to, they probably just didn't have the money, honestly. You know, it's one thing to say, Hey, look, something came up, something happened. I'm going to walk to completely go dark. <laughs> Um, you will get blacklisted so quickly from somebody Mm -hmm. and I had somebody do this and it's like, Oh, you know, guess what? You know, I just took you off my list and I'm never even going to bother considering it again. Um, from that intention, because you know, there's these things called email. This device right here is called the phone. You know, you can use it and you know, (laughs) you should use it because if you don't have the stones to get back to somebody, it's disrespectful. It's unprofessional, and I recommend people not do that. So don't be afraid. 
something happens just i had one guy who was going to close on two assets and said hey last second something came up i'm not comfortable with this one and i really don't want to close mm -hmm. on it fine you know i'm not the one who mm -hmm. spent money on the due diligence and so forth if somebody backs away on one of my assets I, i'm not disappointed in the sense of it's like you let me know if you don't mm -hmm. let me know you are going to piss me off yeah, it's just communication. We've talked about it before. I was talking, having a conversation yesterday with somebody about accountability and follow through someone in the mm -hmm. note space as well. And just, um, doing what you say you're going to do. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, but we, but the one caveat we were talking about is things come up, life happens, right? Maybe they, you thought you had money to buy a note and then, oh my gosh, you need to put your child in private school and this isn't the right move. And, you know, but communicate that's that's the critical part and when you just ghost it's no good in my book um so i do have a note and bolt it's not really note specific per se but i think people might <laughs> chris is worried i have a note and bolt but it's not note specific okay <laughs> well, now now they're now they're banging on the wall okay See, even, um, they're, even they're like what are you talking about <laughs> just end the podcast jamie um so it's personal finance related. And for people with kids, we started using this uh, app called Greenlight. I have no reason to promote it or anything, no financial interest, but um, if you're into kind of trying to help your kids learn personal finance or budgeting, you can set them up with a their own credit card and kind of set whatever controls you want with it. And it's a pretty, very user-friendly app where you can put uh, money on the account and kind of, it enables conversation with your children about um, personal finance and taking control of your financial future. So, uh, so let me hopefully ask somebody question. out there finds, yeah. Are you using it? Yeah, with both and, my kids, primarily kids? my daughter, 11 and almost 14. Okay. So, but what was interesting, my daughter, we, we went to, uh, we set this account up for her and mm -hmm. she got her own card and everything. And we actually went to get ice cream and you know i had her pay for it because just kind of wanted to you know see what it what it, how it worked and everything and i just assumed she knew how to sign a, re a credit card receipt you know she she's almost 14 no clue no clue what to do and i was like wow <laughs> so little things like that come up that you kind of assume as a parent that your kids know and they may not so that even that little piece was was enlightening for her and educational so we are using it to answer your question okay there was a rumor actually uh, at one point in time that um and again this is no political affiliation or representation or support for any or candidate in yeah. a sense uh but there was rumblings once like donald trump did like a pr stunt to like use an atm machine or something and he didn't know how to use an atm <laughs> which honestly <laughs> i think i, I did mean, read that you know, i mean yeah. somebody with the amount of money they say he has, I don't see why he almost kind of need to use one, but um, I still mm -hmm. would think you would know how. Um, interesting story. My last one was when we built our house, we bought a box truck uh, to use to store materials and we drive it around because mm -hmm. we were buying stuff at auctions and stuff. You know, this was a 19, I don't know, 80s, you know, 27 foot box truck, you know, like a U-Haul one you have and stuff. So it mm -hmm. had, you know, you know, the windows, you have to roll down the windows, you know, the phrase today, kids don't understand when you say, Hey, roll down your right. window. Why do you say roll down your window? So my daughter's <laughs> like, you know, we're in it drive one time. She's like, how do I put the window down? I'm like, you roll it down. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you gotta roll it down. So she starts rolling it down. She's like, at the time she was probably, oh, let's see, eight. So she's probably like eight or nine years old. She's like, mm -hmm. this is tiring. And I'm like, yeah, there's no <laughs> little button you got to push nowadays and look at all the technology you have. Uh, but yeah. just interesting things, even, you know, as we grew up that are very, very different now. So, yeah. Well, we take for granted. We were able to drag this out to 40 minutes now, uh, based on that, Jamie. Nice. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, uh, like to, again, thank everyone for joining us on this episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. Make sure to uh, check out our prior episodes as well. Leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Amazon, Google, or your favorite listening station. And as always, go out and do some good deeds. Thank you, everyone.